Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. This is the Warroom to the Boardroom podcast. This episode, we're talking with Kenny Vaughn, Kendrick Vaughn. He and I will be discussing this transition in the technology and the human capital and uh, some of this pivot into the functional areas before he left the Army. For those that don't know, Kenny is a senior manager of transformation operations at Indeed. He spent time as an air defender in the Army. He was a West Point head outreach officer. He's a graduate of both West Point and the University of California Haas School of Business. And so without further delay, one of my mentors, Kenny Vaughn. What's going on, my main man? <laughs> Good to have you here. Can't believe it's been been that long. I remember you, you were like a senior, a firstie, and I was a plebe, and uh, you were one of the first that looked out for me. So it's it's crazy to see it come full circle. Yeah, man. Well, you know, I appreciate the invitation to to be on the show, and I couldn't have said it better myself, man. This really feels like a full circle moment, uh, having a chance to navigate not not only the academy but military service, and now be. Uh, in industry on the corporate side of the house, man, is is cool, man. So appreciate the invitation. Definitely. And so for our guests that don't know you, could you tell us a bit about yourself? Kind of who are you, where are you coming from, and how did you end up in the military and at West Point? For sure, for sure. So uh once again, my name is Kenny Vaughn. I am currently living in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh we are here close to a ton of extended family. So that feels really, really great. But I actually grew up in Army Brad. And so my dad was in the Army for 25 years. Uh, he's also a West Point graduate. And so a lot of my childhood was spent moving around the country, seeing new places, meeting new people. Uh, and that's what actually led me into service myself, was wanting to want to be like my dad, want to follow in his footsteps. But uh, I call Huntsville, Alabama home because that's where he retired. But we, we now are, have planted our flag here in Louisville, Kentucky. Very nice. And could you tell us about like kind of what your journey in the military? So you started as an air defender after graduation, and then you pivoted to a functionary, if that's right. Mm -hmm. And that path and that decision. Yeah. So the the biggest thing for me, probably from the time I was in middle school, was just looking at my dad's life and really seeing how he had kind of laid a blueprint. And really just wanted to follow in those footsteps. And so that's how I ended up at West Point in 2004. When it came time to choose a branch of service, I will, uh, I'll i never forget the conversation that I had with my dad. And he was just kind of giving me the breakdown of all the different branches. He was like, hey, you know, I'm an air defender. I loved it. Uh, just know up front, if you want to be chief of staff of the Army, we'll do all this stuff. You gonna have to go infantry armor or something like that, but you know if you want to go air defense, I'm not gonna stop you from doing it. And so uh, I ended up doing my cadet leadership training the summer before my senior year in Korea with the air defense unit, and really had a phenomenal experience. I mean, just getting a chance to interact with the soldiers. I loved the fact that it felt like there was an analytical side of my mind that could be challenged in the branch, as well as kind of that physical side too. And so. All of that appealed to me. Uh, ended up branching air defense, as you mentioned. Had a really great run. Uh, really, the first six or so years of my military career, doing my base branch all the way up to command. And that's when I had the opportunity to go back to West Point and serve as the director of diversity admissions. And so, applied for that program, was fortunately selected for it. Went to grad school for two years to get my MBA, went back to West Point. Uh, and while I was at West Point, ended up uh, making my final transition to to become an acquisitions officer. I'm sorry, to be to become an ORSA. Uh, my dad was an acquisitions officer. I ended up becoming an ORSA. And that was kind of our first big pivot in terms of our military careers. That makes sense. So operations research. And then can you talk about, so you left the Army as a major, is that right? I did. Thir- 13 years, man. 13 years. <laughs> 13 years in the game. And we made the transition. Can you tell us about, like, I guess, why why that transition point? Because usually, right, people are leaving the five, maybe the eight, you know, maybe the the twenty. Why that kind of interesting space there? Man, we we in a safe space, brother. I I keep one hundred with you. The, the, the listeners ain't gonna snitch on me if I can't tell the truth to them. Do we? we I, I I want my my hosts, my guests, to be as real as to be one hundred and hundred times. Uh so to be completely honest with you. That was probably 
the hardest decision of my life up to that point. And I think what it really came down to was trying to think about as a family, what we were optimizing for. And I I had an amazing army experience. I mean, I, I feel blessed to say that I truly enjoyed every single day that I was able to serve in the uniform. However, comma, uh, both of our kids were getting older. So at that time, I think Taj was uh, fifth grade. Deja was, you know, first grade. I actually went to four different high schools growing up and uh, three different states changed every single year. And we didn't necessarily want that for our kids. And I'll never forget, we were probably about two or three years into that assignment at West Point when our son was like, Dad, I'm I'm tired of moving. Like, you know, when are we going to when are we going to, you know, live in one place and I don't have to keep making new friends. And so that was kind of the seed that was planted for us to try to get back close to home here in Louisville where Seneca's family, where her dad's side of the family is from. And so um, as Painful as I feel a decision it was at the time, uh, I wouldn't change it for the world because I feel like as a family, it was the right decision for us to make at the time. That makes sense. So if I understand you correctly, you're trying to you were trying to optimize for a bit more family balance and stability for the kids, kind of as you looked at your next juncture, your next kind of step in the road. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, I think. It's different for different people, right? Like, you know, I I actually, I'm so thankful I had the experience that I had because I think for me and my personality, the moving around, seeing new places, it informed so much of the person that I've become today. And I'm tremendously thankful for it. But not every kid is going to necessarily be like that. And I think that's one of the tough things that you try to do your best job at as a parent is try to figure out, okay, like what is going to best set my kids up for success, right? Like based on what I know about their personality, based on what they're sharing, like what can we do as a family to best set them up for success? And so that was huge. That was huge. And I think even after the decision, there's still, um, it's such a significant transition because it felt like feels like such a huge part of your identity. And you go through this whole process of, you know, trying to reinvent yourself, figure out, you know, what things are important to you, why you're striving for the things that you're striving for. And so that absolutely is a uh, a continual process. But had I been given the opportunity to do it again, I would absolutely do it again. And the one last thing that I'll say about this is there were a couple other examples that I looked towards who had also made some very late pivots. And so one of the um, West Point graduates who had just done tremendously well for himself was actually Joe Anderson. And he was a 60s grad, I want to say. And he served 13 years, ended up getting out at the 13-year mark and did really, really well for himself. And so there's, there's always a few examples that I think I was able to look to, to, to know that things would be okay on the other side, but yeah, those were all things that were in the decision matrix as we were trying to figure out what was best for the family. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and so I think going, going along that, that route, what did you talk about kind of where you are now and kind of talk about that discovery process? So that we mentioned earlier that you're indeed, um, did you know, Hey, I want to work in this space. Or was it kind of, you know, business school or like West Point? How did you kind of come and navigate that decision of, you know, I'm hanging up being an army major. What do I really, what do I do next? And what does that look like? So I think one of the most informative experiences that really helped shape how I want to spend the rest of my career was that time serving at West Point in the admissions office. When I tell y'all we've done that job for free, and you know, because you haven't been there, you know what it's like being outreach. Man, when I say we've done that job for free, oh my goodness, man. Like every single day I woke up with such a deep sense of purpose, a clarity as to the goals we were trying to reach, 
Uh, and most importantly, like a very deep sense of service, right? We're, we're trying to help young black and brown kids from across the country get education, right? And whether it's West Point or it's another program, like you get a chance to serve as a mentor, you get a chance to serve as a voice of wisdom, you know, try to breathe life into people's dreams. And the only downside about that is like, once you are in a job that gives you that level of fulfillment and satisfaction, it is almost impossible to go back, right? Like it's really, really hard. And so for me, as I was thinking about the next steps of my career, I knew that I wanted to do something that was very client facing. You're working with people, you're engaging, you're interacting, you're getting a chance to hopefully inspire and empower people to become the best version of themselves. And so those were all of the things that were kind of going on in the backdrop. At a much more tactical level, something that I didn't realize was going to be as big of a factor is the influence of the relationships that I had built in the military and how they informed my decision making, right? And so when I transitioned out of Fort Knox, the job that I took was at a company called Breakline Education. And I hadn't heard of that company before. But one of my really good friends, Rafael Ruenge, uh, reached out and said, man, I, I think I found the perfect job for you. Like, I'm looking at this job description and this thing got your name all over it, right? And it's, I think that's the funny thing about life is you have this grand plan or you got this grand scheme in mind. And like, it never turns out the way that you think it's going to, but it always turns out the way that it's supposed to. And so that's kind of informed a lot of my major career decisions, very similar kind of trajectory with how I ended up at Indeed. I had a mentor who had joined a few months before I did and was building out his team and said, hey, I think you'd be a great fit for Indeed. Uh, That particular role didn't work out, but going through the interview process and just kind of seeing what type of company Indeed was, um, the role that I'm actually in now on the chief of staff team was a perfect fit. and. Yeah, I love the work I'm doing. Tremendously rewarding and just excited to see what the future holds. Very helpful. And so can you talk a little about exactly what you do at Indeed 1 and then 2, what was kind of the education or experience requirement for that kind of role, for especially for veterans who are trying to figure out, you know, do I jump straight in? Do I go to school? Do I go to a training program? Can you talk through that thought process a little bit for us? Yeah, absolutely. And so... Just contextually, for folks who might not know about a ton about Indeed, our primary mission is to help people get jobs. And so what I loved most about Indeed, first and foremost, was it had a very crisp, easy to understand, easy to get excited about mission. And I think for a lot of us who serve, we are very mission-oriented, mission-driven type of people for the most part. And so for me, that was absolutely something that I was trying to optimize for, you know, and coming to Indeed. In my current role, I am on uh, the chief of staff team for our enterprise portion of the business. So companies that have roughly over a thousand employees would fall under the enterprise segmentation. And I do a lot of internal HR related work. And so as you think about culture initiatives, um, you know, how people show up, as the best version of themselves each day, Um, how people are able to to reduce stress and how people are able to learn and grow in their roles. I partner with our HR team and our diversity team to help kind of stand up the initiatives that empower people to do that. And then the other portion of my role is really geared around trying to find efficiencies in different processes. And so This year, we did a ton of hiring. We hired a lot of software engineers at Indeed. And one of the projects that I worked on was trying to figure out how we could do that most efficiently, right? And maximize the resources, shorten the interview time, think through, you know, where we could find, you know, diverse talent. And as I'm doing this work, I'm just reflecting over all these very applicable Army experiences that I've had, which really set me up for success as I'm trying to think through problem solving. Because that's the piece that I feel like I wish I would have understood a little bit better as I was transitioning out because I don't think I would have worried about it as much. But like, 
we have this incredible skill set that we're leaving service with, right? The ability to, to, to think analytically about very ambiguous problems, the ability to put systems and frameworks into place, the ability to communicate and articulate a vision and a strategy. And these are all things that I think because we're in spaces with peers and mentors and mentees who have very similar skill sets, we kind of just take for granted. But it's not until you enter the corporate space and you realize that that's not a skill set that everyone possesses and the value that you bring to the to the room when you're able to provide that structure and that clarity. Oh, man, that was really, really empowering. And, and the only caveat that I, that I would add to that is that didn't happen on day one necessarily, right? Like it took a few months of learning the landscape learning the business, understanding where I fit in the big puzzle to, to really get that confidence. So if you described your role through like an army or military lens, would you say it's it's more like being in command? It's more like being an XO, a little bit of hybrid of all of the above, a little bit of outreach in there. How would you think about that for someone that has no idea if they didn't go to business school like we did? Yeah. How do you put it in that kind of, I guess, jargon so they get it? So I think it'd be like a, a very, a very thin hybrid between like S3 operations where you're like trying to figure out the plans and you're trying to figure out which initiatives you're going to allocate resources to. You got some S1 in there. So you got to work with some personnel, make sure you understand, got the policies and, and got that understanding. But then I feel like there is this very real command element and aspect where you still have to execute and deliver and galvanize and get people excited about it. And so on a day-to-day, it's really like that that planning and operations that you'd see in an S3, a little bit of S1 with the personnel piece in there, and then to bring it all home and get across the finish line. I think um, some of those basic principles that you may learn in command were very, very applicable. That, that makes it much more clear. And so along those lines, like how did you get to that that point? So you mentioned one, you know, kind of having that conversation with a child that ultimately kind of culminated in you deciding to leave. Were there any specific mentors or programs that you used to to plan for that transition process? And when did you start really thinking about it from like, this is an idea to I have a timeline and I'm starting to put resources in place? Yeah, so... I'm trying to think of the best way to unpack that question because there's a number of different <laughs> there's a number of different ways we can take that thing. So what what I would tell you, I think the most transparent and honest answer is that there was never really just like this very clear plan of like I know I want to get out on this date. This is where I want to do it from. Even when we moved here to to Louisville in the middle of the pandemic. My original plan was to spend some some time at Cadet Command, potentially take a couple of different course abilities here for it. And so like, it wasn't necessarily even set in stone when we got here. I think what really tipped the scale was just seeing how fast the world was changing. And I know that sounds like a crazy thing to say, but contextually, one thing that I think is important to understand is there was no such thing as remote work, even when I left West Point, right? Like, you know, and so the net that you're able to cast in terms of remote opportunities is so wide. And I think from that first year of working from home in the uniform to then realizing that there was an entire new landscape that was available. And I didn't just have to look for jobs here in in Louisville, Kentucky, but now, literally, you can work for global companies, you know, from the comfort of your home and still drive impact. That was a huge factor in the decision making process. And so longer answer to a shorter question in terms of mentors, I feel like, man, there were so many. There were so many folks who were willing to uh, both from my business school experience, my time in admissions um, even here at Fort Knox, who are willing to sit sit down and just have like a no kidding can of conversation about next steps and career moves. What I will say is if I did have one piece of advice in terms of seeking advice, it is 
learning to understand how to have confidence in trusting your gut and knowing what you want in your heart. Uh, because people people can only give advice from their perspective. And so you're going to run into people who, you know, there, there were a few folks who, you know, when I shared I wanted to transition out of 13 years, they were like, oh, oh man, you, <laughs> but brother, you've given so much already. And like, I know that, I do. I, I completely understand that. I really do. And, you know, it's not that, not that you lose any respect for folks, but, you know, it's just, it's just understanding that everyone has such a different lived experience, right? And the the things that are important to you may not necessarily be important to someone else and vice versa. And so in the same breath, I would also say, regardless of what the final recommendation was that someone gave me, there was always a piece of wisdom to be taken away from the conversation. And so just to further go down that line, even the folks who were really like advocating to stay in, what what I took away from those conversations was, hey, make sure you have a plan to keep your family on good financial footing, right? Like that's, that's what I started to interpret those conversations as, hey, make sure that you understand the risk that you're getting ready to assume by making this decision. And if you're okay with that risk, hey, go ahead, do what you gotta do. And so I think it was the culmination of so many conversations that ultimately led to the decision. Uh, but when your kids come to you, man, oof. When, when the kids come in, they're like, but daddy, <laughs> you might not know when you got to make the decision, but you know what decision you ultimately have to make. And so that, that I think was the driving force and finally deciding to hang it up. No, it's that 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 sums it up well. And so one, you know, taking good nuggets out of each conversation that you have, taking people's advice with a little little bit of salt, since you know everyone has their own perspective and bias, which I think is a great point. And so immediately after leaving service, did you take any kind of break or did you kind of just kind of dive straight in? I guess where there's any like, I guess, adjustment period or you know, I know with family sometimes you're like, hey, it's just I just gotta Keep keep making this money to make it happen, but I I went straight into the deep end. I <laughs> I don't know if I can actually say this on the airways because this could be slightly controversial. But I, but I actually I actually during my during my term leave I started working um, for Breakline, and so I was dual had it there for a little bit. There was a decent amount of overlap. Hindsight being twenty twenty, I think that was probably the best avenue for me. Because sometimes and people have different personalities, right? And so for me, uh, I do best when I'm in motion, right? And so keeping the progress, keeping the momentum going, uh, we did take a very short break after I finished my terminal leave. But I think at least the way my mind works, sometimes that too much time or too much space just gives me a little bit of anxiety, man. I just start getting a little angst, start worrying about stuff. And so it felt good being able to get a start, understand what the landscape was, and then take a little bit of a break. That being said, I also completely understand if, you know, whether it's a month, two months, because it's such a significant transition. Like, I could probably spend the next hour talking about, like, from a physical, mental, emotional, spiritual level, like you're asking yourself these questions, you're trying to figure out like what it is that matters most to you, where you get your sense of purpose from, like you're navigating a level of ambiguity that I know I was not necessarily prepared for mentally. And so you're having to show up in a different way. And so there's all these things that you're kind of having to figure out, interpret, course correct on in stride, right? Which I think that was the most difficult part for me. I, you know, I'm a year and a half out from my transition now. And I feel like I'm just now starting to like figure out what some level of normalcy feels like in my role and life post-military. And so if I could give one piece of advice on that front, give yourself grace, give yourself space, give yourself time to process the gravity and the magnitude of 
uh, the transition out of service. That's, that's a great point. How long do you feel like it felt you to get like your footing or kind of have an understanding of what you're really doing? And I guess the nuances of military versus civilian, especially as someone that's, you know, second generation or multiple generations into the military. So I'm going to try to say this in the most humble way possible because I, I, I promise this is to try and get this. So one of my mentors, actually Herman Bull Sr., he, uh, I remember having a conversation with him about the transition and, you know, I was kind of on the fence either way. What should I do? Like I'm worried about all these things. And he said something I'll never forget. He said, cream always rises to the top. Hmm. So you might not necessarily know all the answers. You might not necessarily have everything figured out, but you got a good work ethic. You know, you uh, are a lifelong learner. You know, you are open to feedback. And you're going to put your best foot forward in all things that you do. And I feel like that part of the transition was actually pretty easy because if you're willing to put in the work, the same work that made you successful in the military, that same work ethic is going to deliver big time success and um, make you understand the landscape at a much quicker rate than I think a lot of your peers would if you were willing to put in the work and the effort. And so I don't think it took a ton of time. My bigger thing was now that I have this so many more degrees of freedom, right? Where if I did just want to pivot to a new industry next year, I could do that. Like trying to figure out and make sure the path that I was on was the path that I wanted to be on, right? That was the bigger piece of the transition for me. And I feel like we're arriving to that space in a healthy way. So a lot of introspection, a lot of questions and soul searching, reaching out to mentors to really affirm those questions. I think that that makes perfect sense. And so can't can't be afraid of introspection now. You, you can't be afraid to do some soul searching. If there were, look, man, I'm trying to tell you, if, if there was one thing that I would recommend, if we had to stop the podcast right here, I could say one last thing. It would be, man, the more reflection, introspection, just kind of think about what matters to you and the values that you want to live by and espouse to. The more that you can do that, everything else I feel like after that is pretty easy, right? Like you can learn everything else, but it's really the question of who am I and who do I want to become, right? Like, because you have so much more freedom over the answer to that question then I would say you do on the military, right? Where you kind of have a, a, a fairly guided path that you're on that you can see pretty far into the future on, right? Here, it's wide open spaces. And so you have to be willing to navigate that journey in a way that you may not have had to navigate it before. And for me personally, that reflection introspection has been the number one thing that's helped um, move things forward in a very rewarding way. All amazing points. And so from here, where where are you trying to go? You know, I'm still very open. If I'm being completely honest, Indeed is an amazing company. So the first thing that I would say is I feel like it's a place that I could spend the next five, 10 years at and grow my career and really love and enjoy it. And so I think for the first time, one of the first times in life, it feels nice not necessarily having to have the answer, right? And I think one of the biggest things that's top of mind for me right now is the age of our kids, right? And so this year, our son starts high school. He'll be graduating in four years. And so for me, one of the biggest things I'm thinking through is like, how do I choose a career? How do I choose roles that allow me to be present? that allow me to maximize this very finite time that I have with our kids while they're in the house. I'm not necessarily worried about being successful because I think that's one of the great things that you realize once you get a little bit further along in your career is you know you have what it takes to be successful, right? Now it's just what it is, what are you trying to optimize for? And so 
I feel like there's a really great balance that I have at Indeed right now that I'm excited about that also still allows me to, you know, spend time with my kids, be present. You know, I'm working fully remote right now. And so that's a whole level of freedom uh, and flexibility that really allows some beautiful things to, to transpire in life. And I'm excited about that. Yeah, I think I think the the ambiguity of the journey sometimes for a lot of people that can be a little scary, especially when you you're used to the military. Like, hey, if I follow DA Pam so and so, you know, I hit my paces and my marks, I'll be six hundred and three. What was it? Six hundred six hundred dash three? Is that the? And that's the one right there. That's the one. Like, I'll be a major for this. I'll be a lieutenant colonel for this long, and then you know, I'll either make colonel, I'll retire, and it'll be. Can I can I just add real quick that. In full transparency, that has been one of the hardest things to do is to really release expectation. That's been so hard, man. Like, if you would have asked me this question even six months ago, I'd be like, oh, man, you know, I want to be a VP, then I'll be chief operating officer, then I'll go do this, then so, so forth. And it's like, you have this whole vision in your mind of what it is that you want to do and how you want to get there. And the more and more you think about it, you realize, okay, so I get this promotion. What does that really mean? I get a little bit more responsibility. I make it pay some more. What does it do to my time, right? Because the thing that is most, I'm going to keep it 100 with you. The thing that's most valuable to me right now is my time, right? You know, from a financial perspective, feel great about that. From, you know, a responsibility, like all that stuff feels real good. The number one thing that matters to me right now is my time. And so, There's a very real trade-off there, right? And you have to, life is all about trade-offs, man. And and I think that was initially a tough pill to swallow. But with each passing day, it's gotten so much easier because when you get a chance to see your kids grow up, when you get a chance to spend no kidding quality time with the person that you love, like this is, this is stuff you you can't go back and redo a lot of these things, right? You can you can go back, you can get a, a nice title, you can do all this stuff, but there's some things that you can't go back and do. And so for me, that's where the, the mindset and the mentality of just releasing comes from. And I wholeheartedly believe that you know, good Lord plan is perfect plan, man. God don't make no mistakes, brother. You know, I don't, you know whether you, whether you're spiritual or not. I, I wholeheartedly believe that, you know, in in the words of Paulo Coelho, one of my favorite authors who wrote The Alchemist, the universe is always conspiring in your favor, right? And if you're willing to do the things that are on your heart to do, if you're willing to be a good person, have a good work ethic, things always work out in the end, man. And so I'm. I'm leaning on that. I'm trusting on it. And uh, we're going to see where it takes us. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. I'll segue into books and podcasts that can help you with transition. But I think my takeaway from that book is that you can search the world, but the treasure is already inside you, right? Like you don't necessarily need to go and look for all these badges, whether it's this degree, this certification, this company in your background, you know, focusing on what that agency what you're looking for. I think that was one of the biggest conversations that Dr. Gibson and I had. Like, hey, uh, sometimes, you know, you're looking for agency and like all these things sound great, but it's not really what you're looking for. Yeah. And so uh, I guess along those lines, were there any books, podcasts, resources? You talked about a few programs like Breakline. Did you use any of those resources that our listeners can possibly like listen into or tune into to kind of help figure out this whole journey? Yeah. So in terms of graduate school, I got to give a plug for the consortium, uh, CGSM, the Consortium Graduate Studies and Management. It is a phenomenal program. And I think whether you're trying to um, earn a graduate degree while you're in service or afterwards, there are so many great organizations, consortium being one of them, that really, really have cracked the code on Uh, helping facilitate that process. And so that's a really great one. MLT is another great organization, which I didn't personally participate in, but I know a ton of people who have gone through that program and have nothing but great things to say about it. For me personally, I think one of the things that was most helpful is 
just understanding the the value and being a lifelong learner and just being curious about things. And I think that curiosity, especially in terms of the transition, because you don't know what you don't know, right? And so I think having conversations with not just mentors, but you know, LinkedIn. Okay, let me make a LinkedIn plug real quick because then this is this is one thing I think, especially as service members, we don't talk enough about. Man, LinkedIn is the plug, right? Like, and it it, it took me working at Breakline and working in you know job placement and service and in recruitment this whole to see how impactful of a tool LinkedIn really is. I think people underestimate the willingness of others to help as you're on your exploratory journey, right? And so if you want to work at a Google, if you want to work at, you know, a, you know, insert the name of any company, a Nike, you know, you work at these companies, there, A, there's probably someone in your network who works there. B, if there's not someone in your network who works there, you'd be surprised how many people would be willing to make 15 minutes of time for a coffee chat or a phone call and say, hey, I see you're doing this job at Nike right now. Would, would you mind, you know, would you be open to a 10, 15 minute call? And people, at least I noticed throughout my transition, were so gracious with their time. And I think that's a very, very important part of research, not only about companies, but about yourself, right? Because you'd be five minutes into a conversation and you hear someone talking about their job and you're like, oh, not for me. <laughs> <laughs> And vice versa, right? Someone starts talking like, oh my gosh, like, I really want to do what you're doing. And so LinkedIn is a really, really powerful tool in terms of the professional network. And then the last piece that I would say is there's some really good podcasts out there. A few that were helpful to me, Guy Rizdahl, how they built it. I just love hearing about how companies were built, the entrepreneurial story. Um, that was a good one. Th- there's a ton. There's a ton of expertise. And I think what I loved most about listening to the podcast was at a certain point, stories just start to get normalized. Like you hear a founder story enough times, you hear the story of how someone is successful enough times, and you start to see like, yeah, the the details may be a little bit different. The details may vary, but there are like some very fundamental principles and attributes that almost all these people have in common, right? It's the willingness to take risks, the willingness to work hard, the willingness to not be afraid of failure, the willingness to, you know, ask for help. Like all these very basic things, I think, at least for myself, I took for granted. You hear them over and over and over and over told in different ways from different perspectives. And I think at some deep level, it helps you realize that the people who are out there and quote unquote, tremendously, they're no different than you and I, right? Like, you know, they have the same struggles, they have the same worries and the same concerns, but they have been able to hone their craft, hone their approach in a way that has facilitated a lot of success. And so that's part of the reason that I loved hearing the stories as well is because I feel like it allowed me to see myself in a very tangible way and even shout out to your podcast, man. Like, I think what you're doing right now is so powerful, right? Because when you can see yourself in someone else's lived experience, I think it makes it a lot less intimidating. And so I want to give you a kudos for creating the space and a platform for people to hear stories from people who may have an experience that's fairly similar to theirs, because that's such a empowering thing to be able to, to do. I agree. Uh, I would say also business school is probably another one of those where you have the opportunity to talk to influential leaders, CEOs from you name a Fortune 100 company, and they're telling you about their struggles, their leadership challenges, especially ones that are spotlighted in the news. And then also some of your classmates where you're like, oh, well, if they can be a consultant or a private equity person or whatever it is. I'm in class with them. And they seem to be going through normal struggles, whether it's recruiting or, you know, going through this great assignment just like I am. And so it's like, no, they put their pants on one leg at a time, no matter whether we're an executive, everybody. Can I make one quick disclaimer on business school? Go for it. Absolutely. The one thing that I would say is 
I had a phenomenal experience at Berkeley Haas. Let me just start by saying that. It was a transformative experience. I'm so tremendously glad that I got a chance to go through uh, the two-year full-time MBA program. That being said, I want to make sure that people understand that you do not have to have an MBA to be successful in business, in industry. Will it give you some some tools and some skills and more, most importantly, a network that can facilitate and potentially expedite said success? Absolutely. But I, so many people, the large majority of people are able to successfully progress in their careers, uh, navigate transition, continue to become subject matter experts in their field without an MBA. And so the big caveat that I would give for folks who are considering an MBA is really leverage some of these organizations that help provide scholarship dollars, really reach out and apply for scholarships at these schools because a lot of these schools, they got huge endowments, so they have money. And so do not hamstring yourself with several years of student loan debts unnecessarily unless you feel like it's something that you absolutely have to do because there's so much scholarship money that's being handed out. There's so many opportunities for you to get a free education. There's so many opportunities for you to really progress from that perspective without being hamstrung with that financial burden where it it almost be the case where if, if I knew I had to incur the full amount of that tuition, I don't know if I would have gone to business school, right? Um, and so that's just something that I'll, I would leave people with in terms of thinking about next steps and big decisions is you can absolutely be successful with or without an MBA. No, I think it's a good point. Um, to your point about the introspection, making sure that it's it's the right path for you, no matter what it is, business school, law school, going straight into industry. I think that's that's super important. And so kind of talking about your transition, you mentioned various nuggets of things that you would do or do differently, kind of a bit more tactically. Are there any changes that you would make your transition journey, whether that was, you know, your last assignment, your benefits, education, career field, anything like that that you would do a little differently if you had to go back and do it all over again? I do have one specific piece of advice, and I think. It, it's two pieces, but I think they weave in to each other fairly well. The first piece is I would not have had as much stress and anxiety about it. Hmm. I think that one of the things that the military provides is a lot of predictability. And so in the absence of predictability, sometimes that uncertainty can drive a little bit of angst. And some people, it doesn't bother them at all. Some people, it really gets your nerves going pretty bad. And I feel like I fell in that latter category where it was a very anxiety-producing process leading up to the decision, making the decision, after the decision was made. Like, it was just probably a lot more stressful than it had to be, which... Leads to the second piece of advice that I wanted to give, which is the realization that you're never on an island when you're making a decision, right? You you have so many people that are in your corner right now, just based off of your good name, reputation, and demonstrated track record of excellence, who are willing to share some time with you, to have a great conversation, to put you on game about resources, to ask silly questions to. And I think. Every conversation that I had helped just provide some level of reassurance, some level of confidence in my own skills and my own abilities, and really just kind of bring some semblance of clarity to a really ambiguous transition. And so my number one piece of advice there would be just to talk to people and realize that you're not doing anything that you know, other people haven't done before. Your path may be a little bit different, but you have so many people who are in your corner. Heck, you can add me to that list. If you listen to this podcast and want to reach out to me on LinkedIn, I'd love to have a conversation with you, right? Like there there are so many people 
who would be willing to carve out time to help. Don't go it alone. Because uh, in my experience and the experience of people that I've talked to, that that is never the easier road to travel. Um, and I think it's also the less rewarding road, road to travel, right? Like, you know, it's there, there's something intrinsically fulfilling about reconnecting with folks who were there for you. And don't rob them of that opportunity, by the way. That's the last thing that I would say about that is I was always so surprised when I would reach out to someone and you, you reach out and you just have this deep sense of gratitude for people, you know, carving out time. And 99% of the time, people are actually really grateful that you reached out. They're like, oh man, thank you so much for thinking of me. Like, I know this is really big for you. I'm glad you thought enough of me to reach out. Like, you know, so don't, don't rob someone else of the opportunity to be a blessing in your life. Right. Cause that's all part of it too. And so logistically, tactically, there's a million things you could probably tweak and finesse, but I think holistically, those would be the two biggest pieces of advice that I would want to leave folks with. Thinking about holistically, making sure it's spiritually aligned and aligned with kind of those other elements. No, that, that makes sense. Yeah. Because the thing is, it's easy to get lost in the details of so many different paths out there. I think the thing that threw me most off guard was like, it, it is a virtual buffet. And if you're not... <laughs> You can be at the dessert bar when you should be over there by the, the steak. Some people like a single course. And when you used to eat a single course and now you're all of a sudden at the buffet, that's intimidating stuff, man. <laughs> and then you get the flood of like LinkedIn messages and <laughs> all the headhunters. And you're just like, oh, man, I don't, I don't really know. What am I going to do? Oh, man. Oh, and so I think, you know, last few points, things that you would do the same. It seems like you spent a lot of time being very intentional and mindful of what you want to do next. Would you would you keep that the same? What else would you do the same? Or if you were to recommend to, you know, the current outreach officer or whoever, you know, follows in Kenny Vaughn's footsteps, what would you tell them? I would say to talk to as many people as you can who've recently transitioned as well, because there's a lot of very fresh wisdom that they'll be able to offer you, whether it's, you know, how to best leverage the GI Bill, Yellow Ribbon Program, um, to participating in a some type of transition program. I mean, there's 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 a lot if you have any type of VA disability, right? Like those are all type of things where, you know, there there are some things that some questions and some resources that you might not necessarily know that you should be thinking about that when you talk to a number of folks who've recently transitioned, they can, you know, help just kind of bring things to top of service because, you know, you're going to go through a very short actual transition window where you're doing your soldier for life and you're getting all those briefings. But at that stage, you're, you're receiving so much information that it's really, it can be difficult to prioritize and internalize what's most important. And so by speaking to those folks who have, recently transitioned out, they can tell you about internship opportunities right before you, you know, transition. That's something that you can leverage and optimize as a program, you know, that that allows you to to do that the last few months of your military service. And so you don't have to try to unearth every single resource, but I think just talking to people who have recently navigated those steps was the most informative thing that I did. And so kind of wrapping up, uh, if people want to learn more about you and your journey and kind of what you're working on, are there any you know, social media sites, websites, company initiatives or side hustles that you want our listeners to, to know about? Well, the first thing that I'll say is I, I'm very serious about reaching out to folks and just asking to have a conversation. And so, you know, please feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn if you want to set up, you know, coffee chat time to, to, to conversate. And, you know, I'm I'm still working on my social media presence, man. You know, this this uh this parenthood thing, you know, is this is maximizing my bandwidth now. But you know, uh I, I I may have a few things, you know, a few uh prior presentations that that I've put out that are on my LinkedIn page that you can check it out if you're so inclined. Uh but most importantly, the thing that I would offer up is you know, if you want to connect, if you want to have a conversation, I, I've been in your shoes before. Uh, I might not have all the answers. I might not necessarily even have the right perspective for you. 
uh, but I'd be willing to have a conversation and share my experience if it's of any help to you. And so that would be the biggest thing that I offer to the listeners and, you know, really just grateful for this platform to be able to share a few thoughts. No, definitely a lot of, a lot of great nuggets. And so we definitely appreciate your time and you can do, do great things, uh, you and Seneca. So thanks again so much for your time. My man, I appreciate you, brother.